Our Father, we thank you uh, for your love and your grace. Thank you that you brought us uh, all here this evening. I do ask your blessing uh, on this uh, service, Lord. This is a, a great topic. We are discussing you and who you are and what that means for us. And so I do pray that you would uh, really impress upon our hearts uh, your nature, your character, help us to learn from it and then to um, apply what we learn to our lives in a way that would be uh, profitable for our sanctification. Thank you for uh, the book of Job, the blessing it is, and I pray you would teach us through it today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I've been teasing this for a while. We have today, in the book of Job, a surprise mystery guest. And I guess here, and here's why I say that. Way back in chapter 2, the author of Job set the scene. All right, Job has just had this, you know, these horrific experiences happen to him. He has three friends come. They are not very comforting. They uh, start attacking Job. Job replies, and we have chapters and chapters of this dialogue. And so the scene is four people talking. And then in chapter 32, it's like, surprise, there was a fifth person there the whole time. It's kind of this like plot twist. This guy kind of drops into the scene and then drops out, and it's kind of like kind of weird. What was that all about? Uh, we see who that person is in the first five chapter, or the first five verses of Job 32. So these three men ceased answering Job, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzzite, of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer, and yet had condemned Job. Now because they were uh, years older than he, Elihu had waited to speak to Job. When Elihu saw there was no answer in the mouth of these three friends, his wrath was aroused. So here's the situation. We've had these chapters and chapters of back and forth between Job and his friends. And Job has won the debate. It's actually what, what, what's happened here. It, it says there that Job was righteous in his own eyes. Now, from his friend's perspective, he was self-righteous. He was defending himself a, against uh, their accusations and refusing to um, confess this nondescript sin that he supposedly committed. And so they think he's righteous in his own eyes. From Job's perspective, though, he has, in, in terms of the argument, vindicated his integrity. He has proven that he is not righteous and maybe like the, the ultimate is the perfect, but in this particular instance, he is right. <laughs> There's a difference between right and being righteous. He is right here. And uh, in this particular instance, he has uh, proven that he is righteous in this regard. His friends are now silent, but Job is still not satisfied. He still believes that God has mistreated him, that he doesn't deserve what has happened to him, and he doesn't know where to go from here. And into that scenario, Elihu walks into the scene. He's identified there. It, it lists his family and his son and his tribe and all that. that. That's not really pertinent to us here. We do see the reason for his silence. Why hasn't he said anything for these, you know, I think it's 30-odd chapters that we've been going through? Well, it's because of his age. Apparently, he was younger than everyone else in that culture. You defer to the older, and so he's kind of waiting his turn not speaking. But why does he speak now? Well, it's because his wrath was aroused. His anger was aroused. So my, my very clever punny title, The Whippersnapper Snaps. You get it because he's young, and then he snaps. Okay, that, that's the, I had to get the, get, the, get the joke in there. The Whippersnapper Snaps. So his wrath is aroused. One against Job, because from Elihu's perspective, Job has justified himself rather than God but also against uh, Job's friends, because they let Job beat them, and he's, he's upset about that. They haven't answered and continued this long, drawn-out dialogue that already went longer than it should have. So the whippersnapper snaps. And Elihu has this message. Elihu was waiting and listening because of his relative younger age. Uh, look at verses 6 through 9. So Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young in years, and you are very old. Therefore I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. Um, I said, age should speak, and the multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in a man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Great men are not always wise, nor does the aged always understand justice. So now we don't know exactly how old Job and his friends are. It's kind of relative. I don't know if we should picture a lot who's like a teenager. No, well, you shouldn't even necessarily picture him as someone like my age. <laughs> it's possible that they're all older than this. Job, we know, dies at 140. And we don't know at what point in his life this all happens. So it's possible they're all quite old by our, by our, by our standards. The, the, the point is not exactly how old they are. The point is that relative to the others, Elihu is younger. And that's 
the issue here. But Elihu insists that he too has wisdom, and this wisdom comes from God, that the Spirit of God is in every man, God gives every man some measure of wisdom, and so he has something to say. Sometimes the aged and the, and the wise aren't always correct, is his argument in verse 9. Um, so Job, or Elihu does acknowledge that Job won the debate, but now he now feels compelled to speak. He literally is going to burst if he does not talk. Look at verse 15. Uh, they, are just, they are dismayed. He's talking about Job's friends. They are dismayed and answer no more. Words escape them. But I have waited because they did not speak, because they stood, stood still and answered no more. I also will answer my part. I too will declare my opinion. For I am full of words. The spirit within me compels me. Indeed, my belly is like wine that has no vent. It is ready to burst like new wineskins. I will speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man. For I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. So there's, th I think the idea is there's back and forth, back and forth. They find there's a pause in the debate. And Allah, who is so compelled, he has to speak. So he's filled up with words. They just want to like flow out of him. His spirit compels him. He, he has this image of like trapped wine that's fermenting. It's going to burst. You know, uh, Alyssa likes to ferment, and we have these little cans on our shelf with different fermented things. As long as they go too long, it starts like bursting out, you know, kind of bu bubbles out. That's sort of the image here with, with Elihu's words. As he's, he's so filled with all this tension. He's, he's been listening to this back and forth the whole time and biting his tongue, and now finally it's got to go somewhere. So Elihu asked Job to give him a chance to speak. Uh, ver, ver, chapter 33 now, the first three verses says, But please, Job, hear my speech and listen to all my words. Now I open my mouth, my tongue speaks in my mouth, my words come from my upright heart, my lips utter pure knowledge. And if you jump down the end of the chapter, it says, Give ear, Job, listen to me, hold your peace, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me, hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. Okay, so, Allah who asked Job to give him a chance here, he claims that his words come from a pure heart that desires to exalt God and to justify Job. Now that sounds pretty good. From all this, we might expect Job to say, or we might expect Elihu, to say something radically new and different from what we've already heard. Okay, but then look at his basic argument in verse 8 of chapter 33. Surely you, Job, have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words saying, I am pure, without transgression, I am innocent, there is no iniquity in me. Yet he, God, finds occasion against me. He counts uh, me as, my, as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. Look, in this way you are not righteous. I will answer you, for God is greater than men. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give an account of any of his words. Okay, so basically we'll see this more as we go along. But Elihu claims that... Um, or Elihu says that Job has claimed righteousness and that his circumstances are not a result of his personal sin. But Elihu says that this is wrong and that Job has, not th has no right to question God, okay, which is basically the same argument we've heard from the other three friends. Okay, so, so he claims to offer something new and different, but then you actually break down his argument, it's like you're kind of just repeating what was already said. So what's going on here? What do we do with Job? What do we do with Elihu? Was he right? Was he wrong? Are his motives good and bad? Uh, this is actually a very hard question to answer. To be honest, I've been dreading this section of the book because I honestly think it's the trickiest part of the, the entire book. It's trickier than the demon dragons we've encountered. Like, it's, it's, it's that complicated. Joe or Elihu presents his arguments as being different from his three friends, and yet when you break them down, it's really hard to figure out what the difference is. And we don't get much help from the narrator of the book. If you go to Job 42 and verse 7, this is like the answer key at the end of the textbook. You know how you like you go through trying to figure out the answer, and then you look at the end to see if you got it right? This is the answer key, because the narrator provides zero commentary on the entire thing throughout the entire book. So you have to wait till chapter 42 to figure out what's going on. And verse 7 of chapter 42 says, And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Tamarite, so that's one of his friends, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. For you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Okay, so at the very end of the book, 
God says, so we know it's, it's got to be right because God says it, says the three friends, they were wrong. Job, he was right. So that's the answer key. Okay, that tells us who was right and who was wrong. Elihu is not mentioned at all. He's not condemned and he's not commended. And uh, the commentators are all over the map in terms of what that means. Either it means he was right, see, because God didn't condemn him. Then you read like the next commentary and it says that Elihu was so irrelevant and so unimportant, God didn't even mention him. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> where do we go from there? Um, and, and that's part of the problem is that here it's open to interpretation. It, it's not cut and dry. And we're going to flesh this out. We're going to cover a lot. If you see like the, the footing there, we're going to cover chapters 32 through 37. So we're going to fly through this. Um, and the reason I didn't draw it out is because it would be the same message six times, and we, we'd all be bored. So we're going to try to summarize it here. But as we go through this, we're going to see that Elihu is very angry. He's very indignant. He seems to make the same mistakes that the other friends made. And yet, he's also God-centered in a way that the others were not. Okay, so like I said, there's a lot of debate about what do we do with Elihu. Okay, I, I've been studying this off and on for about two years now. Here's my conclusion, okay? Ready for this? Here's what we do with Elihu. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Maybe a little less, you know, precise than you were hoping for. But here's, here's, what I, here's what I'm saying. What's going on in Elihu's heart is secondary to the purpose he fulfills in the narrative. Okay, that's what I think is important here. Elihu accomplishes something in the life of Job. And that's why he's mentioned in the account. Okay, well, why is he brought up at all? It's because he does something here. The conversation has gotten off the rails. It's become about Job and not about God, which I, I think it's worth noting. That's not really Job's fault. The three friends came and attacked him, and he defended himself. But then that's what the whole discussion is about. It's about, is Job righteous? Is it not? And that's the wrong question to be asking. Job has discovered that merely defending himself before God and men isn't satisfying. He's spilled his guts. He's made his defense. He's let off steam. He's shared his emotions, and none of it has helped. He's still left empty. I personally think, personal opinion, that Elihu behaves like a jerk in this whole thing, okay? But for the purpose of the narrative, that doesn't really matter. He does provide a positive contribution to the conversation. Elihu rather forcefully turns the conversation off of Job and onto God, which is where it belonged the whole time. It's no longer about, was Job righteous or was he not? It's about, is God righteous or is he not? So he frames the question correctly, even if he gets the details wrong. And that allows for a segue for God to show up and say, yes, let's keep talking about me and what we ought to be talking about. So what's my application to all this? We've th that, that was the introduction. We were just now getting the main point here. God intervenes. So th this is something I wanted to take away from. Well, I don't think it's necessary to say that Allah was right. He does correctly turn the conversation back to God where it belongs. So I want to use this time to look past Elihu's attitude and instead talk about God. Uh, the, the, the next few sermons I think are going to be, I'm excited about them, whether you are or not, because we're going to spend several weeks talking just about God, starting tonight. God is faithful and kind to intervene in our lives. And, and that's kind of what I want to take away from this. When our focus becomes too much on ourselves, God drives us back to himself, not because he's proud, but because he desires our best, and we cannot experience our best without focusing on God. God will sometimes use painful and humbling means to point us to himself, like whippersnappers who snap. Sometimes God uses unkind and mean people to remind us of himself. Have you ever experienced that in your life? In this way, critics can become blessings. So let's start by praising God that he does intervene in the life of our children, of his children, to draw them back to himself. So we use the remainder of our time to, to go through this rather quickly and just look at who God is. What does Elihu tell us about God that is correct, even if his attitude may not be correct? And the first is that God is just. Elihu reminds us that God is just, and his justice is not merely hypothetical or theoretical. It's something that we can experience just as we experience food. Look at the first four verses of Job chapter 34. Elihu further answered and said, Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who have knowledge. For the ear tests words as the palate tests food. Let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. 
Job invites his listeners to really meditate on what he's saying, to test it, to eat it like you would food. Just as the palate determines whether food is good or not, he says, chew up my words, swallow them, see if they are right. Um, he then is pretty mean to Job in the next few verses, and we're, we're going to graciously overlook that and consider what he says is actually true. So when we get down to verse 10, it says, Therefore listen to me, you men of understanding, far be it from God to do wickedness, and from the Almighty to commit iniquity. For he repays man according to his works, and makes man to find a reward according to his way. Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. God is inherently and ontologically just. He cannot allow sin into his presence. 1 John 1, 5 says God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. It is absolutely impossible for God to do wickedness or for God to pervert justice. And because of this, we have no right to tell God what he ought to do. Verse 17. Should one who hates justice govern? Will you condemn him who is most just? We, we can't condemn God because he is just. But also this means, in a beautiful way, God is predictable. We can expect God to act justly, because he says he will. You and I have a flawed sense of justice. It is fallible and prone to biases. But God is just, his justice is perfect and holy and good. And this matters when we're facing trials. When you encounter difficult circumstances, it's very easy, very tempting to think that God is wronging us somehow. How dare he allow suffering into my life? What gives him the right to inflict pain upon me? I don't deserve this. How come other people don't experience this kind of anguish? And these are not easy questions to work through. I'm not trying to oversimplify it. But the only foundation that will allow us to work through those questions is the justice of God. We're thoroughly committed to that fact up front. In the midst of all those questions, we must be thoroughly committed to the reality that God cannot wrong us. He cannot do anything that is a violation of his love and justice. So whatever is going on in our lives, it has to somehow be an expression of God's justice. While we do not understand a lot about our situation or why it's happening, by faith we can understand we have a just God who would do what is ultimately right and good. Connected to this is the truth that God is righteous. Elihu, like his other companions, I think does expose himself by not accurately characterizing Job's arguments. We're now in uh, chapter 35. Bear with me while I'll turn the page here. I got stuck. Elihu says there, Moreover, Elihu answered and said, Do you think this is right? Do you say, My righteousness is more than God's? For you say, what advantage will it be to you? What profit shall I have more than I, if I have sinned? Okay, so Elihu, he's mischaracterizing what Job is saying. He's trying to make Job out to be saying he's perfect, and he's also mischaracterizing Job's argument. Elihu is saying that Job is saying that, well, just, it doesn't do any good to be righteous, because bad stuff happens to everyone. That's not really what Job is saying. Uh, the pulpit commentary says this. Job has certainly argued that his righteousness has brought him no temporal advantage. In other words, no advantage in this life. But he has always had the conviction that he would ultimately be better for it. Elihu, however, does not acknowledge this. And assuming that Job expects to receive no advantage at all for his integrity, argues that God is not bound to afford him any. So, on the one hand, Elihu kind of misses the whole point of the discussion. But he does have a point. The reason to be righteous is not because it gives you sort of ben any sort of benefit on this earth though it usually does. We should be righteous because it is right, <laughs> because it glorifies God and serves our neighbor. And this is the point Elihu makes in verses 4 and 5. I will answer you and your companions with you. Look to the heavens and see, and behold the clouds. They are higher than you. Elihu insists that Job needs to get his eyes off of himself and onto the heavens. Look at the clouds and the stars and remind yourself there is an objective in this universe bigger than you. Verse 14. Although you say you do not see him, yet justice is before him, and you must wait for him. God does care about your suffering, 
and yet your suffering is part of a story that is so, so much larger than you. And God is perfectly capable of bringing a higher purpose out of it. He has a purpose you cannot see, but that doesn't make it not real. There is good coming out of your pain, and God can give us songs even in the darkness, verse 10. But no one says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night? And the point he's making is God does give us songs in the night. Even in the midst of darkness, we can sing to God because God is who he is. But it takes faith to sing in the darkness, as Paul and Silas did in the Philippian dungeon. So God is righteous and will always do what is right, even when we cannot see it. So look to the heavens and see. Uh, bathe in your smallness. In one of the best parts of one of the best novels ever written, C.S. Lewis says in Paralandria, it's a whole context here, okay, but just, just bear with me here. The, the angel tells the man, be comforted, small one, in your smallness. God lays no merit on you, receive and be glad. There's a kind of comfort that comes from being small. <laughs> the, the, from being that we are actually not in control. That seems unempowering, except that we are small in the way an infant is small in its father's arms. There's, there's a comfort in that. So meditate on your smallness. Look at the stars. Look at the clouds, as, as Elihu admonished us to. Think about your mortality and God's immortality. Sit in silence. As we trust God, he does give us songs in the night. He doesn't eradicate the darkness, not yet anyway. He's, he's getting around to that, but not yet. In the meantime, we have darkness. We also have songs in the darkness. And he gives us the strength and the courage to praise him in the night. In addition to God being just and God being righteous, God's also good. And I think that's important to be committed to as well. Um, in the Bible... Wisdom comes from the mouth of babes and divine warnings from the mouth of a donkey. And sometimes good theology can come from arrogant men. And we see that uh, with Elihu here. In the first four verses of chapter 26, this is where I say Elihu does kind of behave like a jerk. Elihu also proceeded and said, Bear with me a little, and I will show you that there are yet words to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly, my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. That's just like the level of <laughs> audacity is just like <laughs> through the roof here. Uh, Elihu sees himself as God's spokesman. It's like his personal responsibility to defend God. And apparently God can't do it himself. And it, it, it just claims that, you know, one who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Like, what a thrill it must be for you to be in my presence. That's kind of the idea here. And yet, in all this, we do see some valuable truths about the nature of God and his goodness. Verse 5 through 7. Behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty in strength and understanding. He does not preserve the life of the wicked. He gives justice to the oppressed. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but they are on the throne with kings, and he has seated them forever. So God is mighty, and yet he despises no one. No one is too small and insignificant for him to take notice. Though he's exalted above all the heavens, he knows your frame, he notices the sparrows, and he counts your hairs. He is just and fair. Every sin will be punished, either by the sinner in the lake of fire or in Christ on the cross. But the flip side of that is God always notices the righteous. He will never take his eyes off of them. What a blessing it is to be righteous in Christ. Elihu says that the righteous will be exalted on thrones forever. Now, Elihu's heir here is that he's talking about practical righteousness and temporal exaltation. So, in other words, if you are just good enough, you will be a king. That, that's kind of what he's trying to argue. But his words are truer than, his, than he knows. Those who are truly righteous by faith in Christ will be seated on thrones forever. That's the, that's the promise of Revelation 20. That's the promise of the coming millennium, is that every righteous deed, every sacrifice you make for Christ will be rewarded. Not a single one be wasted. Uh, and, the, and the beautiful image of, uh, you, you just went through Revelation, and, and the beheaded sitting on thrones. In other words, those who suffered for Christ are eventually exalted. And 
Well, it's true in the ultimate sense of martyrdom. I think it's true on, on lesser degrees as well. Those who suffer will reign. Their patience is rewarded. If you are righteous in Christ, then God will never withdraw his loving gaze from you. And in due time, he will lift you up. Elihu then follows kind of the old tired pattern of accusing Job of sin and insisting that, his suffering, that he is suffering just because he refuses to repent. But in the midst of all the slander and the mudslinging, Elihu notes something about God that is correct. Jump down to verse 22. Behold, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? Who has assigned him in his way? Or who has said, you have done wrong? So here's crazy theological principle. God is smarter than you. God knows what he's doing. No one can teach him. No one assigned him to his role in the universe. It's his by right and by nature. And here's the incredible thing. God uses his endless power to benefit those who are righteous by faith. That's an incredible truth. If you are justified in Christ Jesus, then his attention will never leave you. He will always be looking towards your final exaltation in the resurrection. So God is all powerful, but he's also all good. He is always only good. And because of this, we can trust God during trials. When you are in pain, God may seem arbitrary and pointless. But God is good, and therefore he will not waste your tears on a single one. He will redeem your suffering and bring good out of it. But you must trust him. You must access these blessings by faith. You cannot teach God anything. He does not need you to tell him how to direct your life. God is big enough, but also good enough to be trusted with your life. You, you can trust him even through the pain. God is also majestic. So again, Elihu is onto something here. And God is using this arrogant whippersnapper to point Job to himself. Uh, and we'll see next time we are into this that his monologue becomes a segue into God's self-revelation to Job. And it's sort of beginning to get the focus where it ought to be. Look at verse 24 and 25. Remember to magnify his work, of which men have sung. Everyone has seen it. Man looks on it from afar. So God is worthy to be magnified. We must remember to do it. This is why Elihu admonishes us, to remember to magnify his work. We must be conscious to draw our attention and the attention of others to God. That's not our default setting. We want to think about ourselves. We must be conscious to course correct. You must point it out to yourselves. You must, as it were, hover the magnifying glass over the works of God so that you notice it. It says here that men have sung of God, and so ought we, I think is the implication. Something I've been working on in my life, um, there's a, a part in Screwtape Letters where Lewis talks about, I'm just paraphrase, that the devil hates music and silence, and he wants to replace both with constant noise. I think that's true in our life. I think we have a very noisy society. And so I've tried to be intentional, sort of push back against the devil's strategy. And, and daily in my life, make time for silence and for music, uh, for both. And that's, that's, it's harder to do than you think. When, when you actually are conscious of it, uh, there's more noise in your life than you think. So I'm trying to do, I'm not saying you can do it, just, just try this sometime. Get in your car and don't turn the radio on. And don't turn the CD on. Just drive and just be silent for a little bit. Uh, find ways to get silence into your life, and, and music as well. Good music. Um, I think that helps tremendously. God's work is universally available to all the world, but it's not universally acknowledged. God manifests himself everywhere, though not everyone notices the manifestation. And so that's why we must be careful and conscious and purposeful to notice God, to notice what he is doing, to notice the wonderful works that he has done. We must remember to magnify um, God because of his majestic power in creation. We'll read the rest of chapter 36. It says, Behold, God is great, and we do not know him, nor can the number of his years be discovered. For he draws up drops of water, which distill as rain from the mist. Try to think about what he's describing and what God is doing. Which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. And can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy? Look, he scatters his light upon it and covers the depth of the sea. 
for by these he judges the people, and he gives food in abundance. He covers his hands with lightning and commands it to strike. His thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm. God is so great, we don't even know how great he is. I guess the point of verse 26. He's eternal, his years are without numbers. He has mastery over the rain and the storm. He sustains the earth by his will and his power. Um, this is kind of a theme in the book of Job, is that you see God in creation. That when you are interacting with creation, that should tell us something about who God is. That God reveals himself through nature. And we see this daily in our lives. We had rain today. Okay? <laughs> that there have been clouds in the sky. And, and Elihu's point, and, and it's not just Elihu's point, but we're going to see God make the same point in the next few chapters, is that tells us something about God. That reveals God to us. The rain and the lightning, all of that, tells us who God is. Every day, we're surrounded by messages from God, not special revelation, not audible voices, but the natural revelation of God, revealing who he is. And I really think it's important for us to note this, to concentrate on it. And again, especially during trials, which is the context of this book, remember to magnify God. Take the time to purposefully and intentionally see the majesty of God around you. Sing songs of him. See him in creation. Marvel at his majesty. And this is the first step. Okay, again, when you're in pain, when you're in the midst of a trial, this is the first step towards getting our eyes off of ourselves and off of our own pain and what we're feeling and onto the one who can wipe away every tear. That's the first step towards overcoming any sort of trial or anxiety or fear is to magnify God. One last point here that Elihu is going to make is that God is wise. Elihu concludes that God knows what he's doing far better than us, and therefore we must be careful in challenging him. The reality of God is something that should cause our hearts to flutter, both with fear and with excitement. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 37, after just describing you know, the thunder and all that, at this also my heart trembles and leaps in its place. And again, he argues this from how God operates in nature. Hear attentively the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He sends it forth over the whole heaven, his lightning to the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice. He does not restrain them when his voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth. Likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. So do Allah who talks about the different kind of weather patterns. He talks about the thunder and how that re reveals the power of God. How he sends the storms. He talks about the snow. He, he tells the snow to fall upon the earth. Some parts of the earth, he says that more often to than others. Iowa, he says quite often, snow fall upon the earth uh, more than some parts of the world. We see in, in, the, in the wind, you know, I, I remember uh, Alyssa and I were on a date a few years back. We were at, uh, I believe, Panera Bread. We were sitting there, sipping our coffee and our, our bagel or I don't know, whatever it was. They were like, oh, it's getting kind of windy outside. That, that's, that's interesting. And then it gets dark. And then suddenly, like, the doors of the Panera Bread start, like, flying open. And the workers are, like, clamoring to, sh to shut it. We're like, well, that was weird. We watched this beautiful, it was beautiful to watch the storm come in and roll past. Well, it was the derecho. And we, we didn't know that was what was going on until we start trying to get home, and we can't because there are trees on the road. You know, that was, that was um, <laughs> kind of a, a, a firsthand account of what it's like to, when you ever experience something like that, if you're in a heavy thunderstorm, if you've been near a tornado, uh, some people have hurricanes, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you feel that power. And know that, that is like the fingertip of God. That is God saying, let's have some, some wind over here. God does that without a thought. Despite all our technological advancement, man is still at the mercy of the weather. We can predict it, sort of, kind of. We can negate some of its effects, but we cannot control it by all our efforts. But God can. And Elihu's point here is that God is so much bigger and wiser than we are. Look at verse uh, 14 through 18. Listen to this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. 
Do you know when God dispatches them? Talk about the weather. And causes light, the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced? Those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Why are your garments hot when he quiets the earth by the, sa- by the south wind? With him have you spread out the skies, strong as a cast metal mirror? Okay, so the, the point here is that we can describe nature. We cannot control it. And, and I, I think we overestimate our ability to understand it as well. In some way, the, the modern mind has sort of like tricked us into thinking we're smarter than we are because we can describe things and therefore we think it's not mysterious anymore, right? We can, we, we know how the weather works. Well, there's jet streams. So wh- wh- what's a jet stream? Well, it's caused by gravity. What's gravity? Well, the planets pull on each other. It's like, well, why? Who does that? You keep breaking it all the way down, and ultimately, it's just descriptive. In other words, we're just describing what we've observed. That, that, that's what science is. It describes things that's observed. And because we can name it and call it something and describe it in a textbook, we think that, therefore, we somehow understand it. And so we have mastery over it. And it's not really that mysterious and magical <laughs> and impressive uh, because it's, it's comprehensible, we think. But the fact is we don't know that much. And if we did, we couldn't break it all down. It's a fallacy of, of composition. I think just so we can describe all its parts, we know what it is. That's not how reality works. Uh, the truth is, this universe is sustained by God. And if you wanted to not sustain it, if you want to destroy the universe, you wouldn't have to do anything. You just have to blink. You just have to stop paying attention to it, and we'll all disintegrate. But because we live in a universe where God does notice us, where God takes pays attention to us, the universe makes sense, and we can describe it. Um, Ultimately, we don't know. (laughs) There's so much we don't know about how things work, and I I think we overestimate how much we we do know, even about the part we do know. Ultimately, though, the point here is that God does know. And if he can master the universe, if if he's holding all these planets together, if he's keeping the jet streams flowing just right, this, this razor's edge we're on, of where life is sustainable in this tiny blue dot, and if it was like this much over, this much over, we'd all die. He's got all that going on. <laughs> he can be trusted with your life. That, that's the point. So he's, he's managing the universe, and it's still here. It hasn't fallen apart yet, and that's true of your life also. He will keep your life together, and he's writing the story correctly. Uh, verse 19 says this, Teach us what we should say to him, for we can prepare nothing because of the darkness. Uh, should he be told what I wish to speak? If a man were to speak, surely he'd be swallowed up. Even now, men cannot look at the light when it is bright in the skies, when the wind has passed and cleared them. He comes from the north as golden splendor, with God in awesome majesty. As for the Almighty, we cannot find him. He is excellent in his power, his judgment and abundant justice. He does not oppress, therefore men fear him. And there's a lot in here. There's a lot we could talk about. We're doing like the quick version of this. But I think the point here is this. Rather than telling God what he ought to do with our lives, we should take the posture of a student. We must submissively allow God to teach us through whatever means he deems best. We are not qualified to make judgments about God. We cannot even understand the world around us, how much less the one who is far above and beyond it all. Now, I do think Elihu pushes this too far. Um, We do have a God who has reached down and in wondrous grace revealed himself to us. Uh, We can push the transcendence of God so far that we we can't know anything about him. But here's the point. The transcendent God has reached down to us. That's what I think Elihu fails to acknowledge. And yet his his main point has has some validity to it. Um, It 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 talks about, we, we look at the the skies and the brightness of it blinds us. We, we can't even see clearly in this world. When we're facing trials, it's important for us to fear God, who is excellent in power and abundant in justice. And it's from that, the beginning, the, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Because if we want to have wisdom about what's going on in our lives, about the trials we're experiencing, we have to start with a fear of God. God, the Lord of rain and snow, can be trusted with your life. He is wise. 
He has great power, but his power is not reckless, is not futile, it's perfectly under control and subject to his own wisdom. And he's accomplishing exactly what he needs to in the universe and in your life. So, summarizing all this. Okay, I do think Elihu is, is something of a jerk. <laughs> I, I don't think he's as, as good um, behavior in these chapters. But he's gotten our attention back to God, which is where the rest of the book is going to spend on it in more detail. And this is vital to enduring trials. What should we be thinking about when life is hard? What should we be meditating on? We'll start with this. God is just. God is righteous. God is good. God is majestic. And God is wise. Find ways to regularly meditate on those things. And while I won't clear everything up, it will give you the basis to work from. It will give you something that will keep you sane <laughs> and grounded and secure when life is at its craziest. So praise God for who he is. And let's meditate on all that he has done for us. Our Father, we do thank you. That you are exactly who you are. Lord, this world would be a terrifying place if you were anything less than what you claim to be. And so we exalt you tonight. We praise you for your justice, your perfect justice. You cannot sin. You cannot sin against us. You cannot be wicked towards us. Everything you do is, is right and good and holy. But, but you are good. You are a kind God. You are a loving God. And, and you care about us, each of us, individually. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you are wise that in the exercise of your good power, you always do it correctly. You, you don't misfire. You don't, you don't make mistakes in the application of your sovereign goodness. And so we, we praise you for all these truths. And because of that, we can trust you when life is hard, even when it's ridiculously hard. And so I pray for everyone uh, in this room, every one of us on some level, experiences trials, experiences suffering. And so I pray that you would remind us of these truths in those moments and that you would keep that in the forefront of our mind, and that through that, we might be able to sing songs to you in the night, in order to praise you and exalt you and find joy and peace uh, in the midst of our suffering. We ask you to bless us this week, help us to honor you just in the, the daily lives that you've given to us. I pray we do all things for your glory. Uh, bring us back here next week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.